Good morning, everybody. How was your four-day weekend? Didn't feel like it, right? A lot of work, jobs, all that kind of stuff. Mean homework teacher, or mean physics teachers that have homework you know, on Saturdays. What's that? So there's multiple evil, evil teachers. Okay. It's good. It's nice to know we consistent. <laughs> There is no grasp this Friday. Okay, let me qualify that statement. There is grasp, but it's not here. It's over in the tutorial center, okay? There will be no faculty present. All of the faculty are being rounded up on Friday and uh, taken somewhere secret. No, um, we, uh, this Friday is Women in Engineering Day. And uh, Dr. Kerfoot and I and all the, and the other physics teachers and all the engineering professors, we are all helping with the Women in Engineering Day. We've got more than 100 high school students that are all coming for Women in Engineering Day. Um, we're going to be building towers and mousetrap cars and t helping to get them interested in engineering and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I will be busy all day. I'll be like in this building and you will hear screaming and shouting um, from me and my high school students. Um, but um, yeah, they're sticking uh, Mrs. Cherry and I in the same room to get, it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna, there's gonna be fire. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ms. Cherry and I get along really, really well. So we're just, we're gonna have a ton of fun. Um, so anyway, how do we, <laughs> How do we cope? <laughs> right? Okay. So I'm inviting you tomorrow to come to the lab anytime between eight and two. Normally I'm running my physics 2A students through their labs and my physics 2A students will be there, but you are also welcome to come in because I'm giving them some grasp time also. I'm going to give them a little tiny abbreviated lab to do, but most of the time I will be there from eight to 150, you could walk in anytime and get help. So if that fits in your schedule, um, you're more than welcome to come tomorrow. Normally you can't, normally I would like say, what are you doing here, you're lost, whatever, right? But you're welcome to come in and get help on your physics to be homework, because I'll just be helping them with their physics to it. They've got an exam on Thursday, so they need a little bit extra time to finish the conservation of energy homework. Um, and then, so Friday, the tutors are aware of this, the tutors will be over there in the tutorial center ready to help you, right, with things. They can they can come and find us and contact us if there's something wrong with, like, Wiley Plus. They can shoot us an email, and I can try to fix it. Um, but um, my office hour is canceled this week, Grasp, as far as I'm leaving and Grasp is canceled. But So it won't be in 2.30. It'll be over in the tutorial center. Any questions about that? You know, it feels bad to, like, We've wiped out lab and grass like multiple weeks in a row here. And I tell you that we're going to get back into our normal schedule, but I don't know what normal is anymore. So. Um, chapter, I don't know when, is due, I don't know when. What are we on right now? 22. Sure. And when is that due? Saturday. Saturday. And then chapter 23 is due on Tuesday, right? It better be. Please tell me to do it Tuesday. I don't know either. Um, it's supposed to be Tuesday. Because um, of everything that we talked about last time. I thought I changed all those two days. Pretty sure I did. And I will try to get the um, exam topics to you by Thursday. All right? That's my goal. I just realized I haven't written your exam at all. <laughs> I know what I'm going to be doing today and tomorrow. All right, uh, we were at Emotional EMF, and I just, because it's so much fun, I had to bring it back, right? Okay, right, okay, this, this explosion, this velocity that happens because we can take advantage of Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction and Lenz's law, right, to cause motion, right, from the interaction of magnetic fields and eddy currents and all of that goodness. Let's um, let's get down some math, some formula, formulas. No, that's not what I wanted to say. Quantitative assessment of what's going on here. So this can be a little bit um, so so like conceptually, 
we're not going to do this. This is actually a little bit harder. Okay. So what we're going to do instead is something more like a like a train track, and and the the conceptual setup for motional EMF or causing things to move because of these changes in magnetic flux. <laughs> Oh, I'm counting to 10. Why can't we find this out, you know, at the start of class? That's really what I should test it. One of these years, I was going to say years, one of these days, I'm just going to snap. <laughs> and I'm just going to go back to writing on this thing. And everybody's just going to have to cope. All right, back up, connect. Okay. Oh, it didn't go black. Can you see stuff now? Yeah. This is when you say no and you just, I really snap. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to do like uh, train tracks. These are two conducting rails. And on this set of rails, uh, we're going to set uh, like, a, like a conducting bar. Okay, and this bar can slide up and down the rails. And, and I know this sounds weird, and you're like, why would this ever exist, Mr. Bailey? We'll get there, we'll get there, okay? But we've got we to start simple. And then what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to close the loop. So, so there's like this U-shaped wire Okay, and then there is this bar, and this bar can move. And it can actually move in either direction, I just picked one, okay? And in between the rails, there exists a magnetic field. Okay, everywhere in between the rails. And it just goes on forever, I'm not gonna draw the whole, whole thing. Okay, so what's going on here, and how do we generate EMF in this system. You'll see sometimes, and I probably should have done it, they'll stick either a light bulb or a resistor or something that this thing is somewhere that the energy can get dissipated. So remember, Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, right, is all about these changes in magnetic flux, right? We've got a single turn coil here. Where's the single turn? Well, it goes through the bar around the loop, through the resistor, and back to the bar. There's an electrical connection there. And so we've got this single loop. So N is just N, it's just one, okay? So in all of these situations, it comes down to what is changing for this flux that's in here, right? I can change magnetic field strength, I can change the area of my loop, or I can spin the loop or change its orientation at angle theta. Is the magnetic field strength changing here? No, I just told you there's a magnetic field, right? That's all you know. I didn't say I turned it up or turned it down. Is the area of the loop changing? If I pull on that bar, does the area of the loop, and the loop now, I'm going to erase this, the loop is this thing right here. Will the area of that loop get bigger? It most certainly will. So this is an example where area is changing. Okay? So what is that area? Well, if the um, separation distance between the tracks is called L, okay, um, and this thing moves a distance delta x, okay? We know area is, is like length times width, right, for a rectangle kind of thing. Well, as far as this change in area is concerned, right, it's a change in either the length or the width, and here the change in width is literally the delta x. Remember, it's the chain, not the actual area that matters. It's the chain that matters. And so with all that put back together, my, this, is, this is B 
times a change in area, and then that's B times L times a change in X, and then I put all of that back up here into the EMF, and I get a B, an L, a delta X, and that's all divided by a delta T. But what's a change in distance over change in time? It's a velocity. So, uh, we'll, we'll leave the N in there. I'm going to strip the 9 to sign N times L times B times V. We are going to get a voltage if we move that bar. And vice versa. If we apply a voltage, we are going to get motion. And what I've got there on the screen is the magnitude of the voltage that is generated whenever a conductor moves through a magnetic field, or vice versa. There is a lot more mathematics that goes in to doing that right there. This has got loops in it, and I've got alternating currents and all kinds of things that are happening with this, right? But if we back it up to the fundamental idea, we're back to change a magnetic flux through a coil, you're going to get some kind of motion. Or the other way. If I move a conductor through a magnetic field, I'm going to get some voltage. And one of the examples that we can calculate for this is what happens to airplanes as they fly. What are airplanes? They're big metal tubes. And are those metal tubes moving through the Earth's magnetic field? <laughs> right? So will there be an EMF? Will there be a voltage that is generated, let's say, between the wingtips of the airplane? Most certainly is. Let's calculate how big that voltage would be. So for an airplane, uh, this is an airplane, top-down view, okay, flying at some speed v, right, through the Earth's magnetic field, which in the northern hemisphere would be pointed in because northern hemisphere is really a south magnetic pole, um, we could calculate the EMF. N times L times B times V. Uh, here, there's the, the number of turns is one. We only have one wing. Okay. Our L, the length of the conductor, is the, is the wing span, the distance from one wing tip to the other. And then we need to know the magnetic field of the Earth. I'm not going to throw all of these in here, but just, just if, the, if the speed... I did 540 miles an hour, which is a typical cruising speed of a Boeing 737 with all of its doors on. Okay. That's 900 kilometers per hour. Any guesses as to how much voltage is generated across the wings? Moving at that speed through the Earth's magnetic field? Half a volt. <laughs> Are we going to be collecting uh, energy from this anytime soon? No. <laughs> right? But it is there, and it can mess with some sensitive electronics, and so it's designed for um, to be there. Actually, planes, I don't know if you've ever flown on a plane or ever paid attention to what happens when a plane uh, pulls up to the gate. Um, one of the very first things that happen before they open the doors, before they attach the gateway, anything, okay, is some poor person has to run up with a really big cable and attaches that cable to the airplane. Two things are happening right there. The most important thing is that that cable grounds the airplane. Because the airplane actually has a different potential because it's been flying through the air. And like a big Van de Graaff generator, it's been experiencing charge from that, from the air rubbing on its airframe. And so it can be tens of thousands of volts different. Like you could step out of that airplane and get really zapped, okay, by the static electricity built up on that airplane. So they connect that thing, which grounds the airplane and makes the potential the same between the airport and the airplane. 
Um, the second thing it does is it provides electrical power to the airplane independent of its engines. And so it can, um, it can turn its engines off and still run the air conditioning and all that stuff. Anyway, watch for that poor person. I don't know, do they draw straws every morning? <laughs> you get to run up and connect the... Maybe it's the new person on the job. Always the lowest, lowest on the totem pole, right? Okay. Um, I promised somebody else I'd do a demo at a certain time, so we'll come back to the quiz. Let's talk eddy currents and the power of eddy currents. So um, I'm going to start setting something up, but simultaneous to me setting it up, um, I'm going to have you watch a video. Okay, and the video is going to explain what's going to happen, but then I'm actually going to do the experiment for realsies for you. Okay, so again, an eddy current is this circulating current that exists inside conductors when they experience a changing magnetic flux. We call it an eddy current because it, it, it goes in a circle, like eddies in the water. This demonstration uses an electromagnetic field to break a cola can into two pieces. An empty aluminum cola can is inserted into this three-turn coil. This 400 microfarad capacitor will be charged to 3,000 volts as read by this meter, and then will be discharged through the coil. Let's charge the capacitor. When the capacitor is discharged, it creates an electron current in the coil which increases rapidly to a large value. As the current increases, it produces a magnetic field, which also increases rapidly with time. The rapidly increasing magnetic field induces an electric field circling the axis of the coil. This electric field produces a large electron current in the aluminum can. The electrons circulating around the can in the magnetic field experience a magnetic force directed primarily radially inward, but with a smaller component directed outward along the axis of the can. The capacitor is... Okay. They said a lot of words, right? Okay. You saw some pictures. But basically, if you take a coil, which I have right here, okay, and you send a very large current through it, and by very large, I mean very large, okay? That sudden current, that large current, generates a magnetic field. The can, uh, what do you want, dive squirt 7-Up or Pepsi? 7-Up. Seven seven up. Seven up. A lot of hate your 7-Up out there, that's fine. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to stick that can inside of that coil right there, right, okay? And so I'm going to get a magnetic field generated along the axis of the coil. The can is a conductor, and what does Lenz's law say about new magnetic fields? Right? <laughs> it wants to maintain the status quo. Right now there's no field, and so it's going to fight the change in magnetic flux by generating a field of its own. But that means a current has to be flowing in the can. Well, now I have a current in a magnetic field. And as we know, current carrying things in magnetic fields experience forces. They said at the very end of that description that the force is primarily radial. It's called theta pinch. We're, we're pinching along the, the, the radial axis of the can, okay? But there is a component along the axis of the can. If, two, two ifs, if this works, and two, if I don't die, then the halves of this can are going to launch at about 50 miles an hour. Okay? So, two big ifs. This is the one piece of equipment I've told my wife. If I die at work, it was this thing. Just tell the police, okay? It was this particular uh, apparatus that did it, okay? 
Because there is nothing. nothing. We've got we've got chemicals back there that will give like um, uh, birth defects in your grandchildren, right? We got acids and all kinds of things back there. We have we have heavy weights. We've got things that shoot. We got all kinds of stuff. None of that stuff I'm very afraid of. It can't kill me. It can cause very miserable things in my life. But it can't. This can just kill me, right? Flat out. So I'm going to actually pay attention while I do this, okay? And I'm going to go get somebody. Simon? Um, Simon's going to make sure I don't die. But this, this literally is something that I don't let any of the other physics teachers do. Well, they won't touch it because they're smart, right? But anyway. Um, Am I in projectile range? Uh, Simon is. Okay. Yes. And I'm right. Hold on. It's actually not aiming very well at all here. I'm so excited. <laughs> there we go. I, I, yeah, I, it's, I, I've hyped it up now. It better work, right? Yeah, right? Sometimes it doesn't. Okay. So what this machine is going to do is it's going to charge. I don't know if you can see them. There's two huge capacitors in here, okay? I'm going to charge them up to about 9,000 volts, okay? These things are going to store approximately 500 times more energy than you would use for a defibrillator, okay? Um, so this is very definitely uh, cooked chicken territory. Um, and it is going to um, potentially... It's gonna, it could go off without warning. It, 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 it charges up, normally I'm in control, but sometimes it decides to go off early, okay? So, I will be reading off the voltages on this thing, okay? But it could go off, and as we approach 9,000 volts, okay? Actually, anywhere past 5,000 volts, I want you to cover your ears. This, not yet. <laughs> Always does it. <laughs> giving instructions <laughs> for your safety, right? After about 5,000 volts, you should be covering your ears because it's going to be very loud. It's going to make a bang, okay? And uh, things are going to shoot everywhere if it works, okay? The worst thing that can happen besides my death is it doesn't go off and I have to discharge it manually, okay? It usually involves licking my fingers and hoping. All right. It also has a key. So that nobody turns it on without full knowledge that they are about to hurt themselves. All right. And I always come, to, I've never seen this thing go off. I'm always down here. Okay, here we go. And uh, let's start charging. All right, so we're charging up. No, we're not. This is very definitely a time that you use the one-handed rule. <laughs> All the connections are good. I tested this before the... You messed it up over I the did. weekend, didn't you? I did. I, I simply arrived and that was it. Probably that was it. All right, let's see. Okay.
4,000, 5,000, cover your ears, 6, 7, 8,000, 9,000, all right, here we go, 3, 2, 1. All right. Did you do it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, ha, 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 we got it. And you did hit me. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was for. Okay. I'm gonna send it. You got the other piece. Start sending it around. It's sharp. These are sharp edges. Please be very, very careful. But as the first people who touch it can attest, is it warm? It's warm. Okay. <laughs> we just cut a cola can in half using a magnetic field. That is so cool, <laughs> right? We call this the electromagnetic can crusher, right? Okay, you wanna see it again? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Diet Pepsi or Diet Squirt? Pepsi, Pepsi. It, 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 it matters. <laughs> Okay, so sometimes on the second one, it doesn't cut the can. Uh, what's happened here is the coil expands. It tries to explosively rip itself apart. If you ever come to my office, I can show you what happens when you don't build the coil correctly. I have a piece of wire that is twisted in a grotesque shape that occurs when I fired once and the coil was not um, sufficiently um, reinforced. All right. We can get this to happen again. Check a couple things. It has a tendency to blow its the the, the wiring in here. Yeah. See, we we got one wire to blow out. So you always check. And how many hands am I using? By the way, you guys know that I joke all the time. I am not joking about this thing killing you. You're still laughing? All right. I have a standard check that I do every time I'm going to touch this thing. Got to make sure I got all the pieces parts. Okay. Alright. That 
was the power of Lenz's law and Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. Okay? It is a grotesque use of electrons, but it's fun anyway. It has no real practical purpose in terms of like, like generating electricity or using electricity. Much more efficient ways of cutting cancer, I guess is what I'm trying to say. All right. Let's go backwards, back up a little bit. Sorry, Simon had to know what time that was, and I was running a little bit late, so we will back up because he had other things. To do. That one did that. Ah, let's do a quiz. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> there's something else going on here when it comes to. Lenz's law and Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. We're, we're building to something. We're building to something that we're going to take advantage of uh, next chapter and the chapters after that. Um, and this is sort of a, uh, a bridge, if you were, to building towards the, the master understanding of electromagnetism. It turns out that this voltage that's being generated by Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction isn't the only thing that's there. In order for that voltage to exist inside of a conductor, that means there has to be an electric field. And now, pun intended, we've come full circle. And we're right back to where we started with electric fields. Only this time, this electric field looks a little bit different. The electric fields that we started with, the electrostatic fields, where they started on positive charges and ended on negative ones, the field generated by Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction circulates. It's a field, an electric field, that has the same shape as a magnetic field. But when the magnetic flux through a loop changes with time, it creates an electromotive force around the loop. Don't worry about the integral. And that electromotive force is due to an electric field whose line integral is not equal to zero. Don't in other words, there is a way to make electric fields circulate after all, and it's accomplished by changing the magnetic flux. When Faraday discovered that a changing magnetic flux could make an electric field circulate, he added something extraordinary to the laws of electricity and magnetism. So, by the way, the yellow vectors in that picture were the electric field, okay? And the blue lines were the magnetic field. That last statement, right, when Faraday discovered, right, this connection, he added something extraordinary to our understanding of electric and magnetic fields. <laughs> That's a huge understatement, okay? <laughs> in certain um, Asian philosophies, there's this concept of yin and yang. Um, of, of completeness but opposites. And this is as close as physicists really come to this idea, where one thing complements the other. Electric fields are distinct from magnetic fields. They are caused by different fundamental things. Positive and negative charges make, they have force with respect to each other, and so they generate these fields of force around them because they have charge. In addition to that, everything has a magnetic field, down to the electrons and protons and stuff that's in the nucleus. They all have magnetic fields. This is an intrinsic property of our universe and how things are put together. And these magnetic fields exert forces on each other. What Faraday did is showed how electric and magnetic fields are more similar than we originally thought. The original conception of an electric field as being like a bad hair day, right? It spreads out, starts somewhere, ends somewhere. 
is true. It's it's there, and that magnetic fields circulate, and they always form closed loops. You would think that we would find a symmetry where, okay, if electric fields are bad hair days and magnetic fields form loops, and now you're telling me, Mr. Baylor, that electric fields circulate, the eddy current, which is, gives rise, it, the electric field has to be circulating too. That means shouldn't there be a magnetic like monopole, like a, like just a north pole that has field lines? And the answer is we've never found a magnetic monopole in nature. We've never been able to create one in a lab. Um, and so that symmetry, although mathematically valid, doesn't seem to be observationally or experimentally valid. Um, we're still looking, and if anybody does find a magnetic monopole, let me know you have a Nobel Prize instantly. Um, but as far as we can tell, our universe doesn't um, generate them or allow them to exist. But what does happen is electric fields circulate. And we're going to, in a little bit, there's a piece missing here to the yin and the yang that I'll bring back together, and you're going to be absolutely amazed um, uh, uh, as to what's going to happen. But we do need to uh, make sure that we tick off a few I's and cross a few T's when it comes to applications of what I've just showed you. Like, what do we do with this knowledge of Lenz's law and Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction? I've already talked about hard drives and microphones and electric guitars and all this kind of thing. But let's take it another step to the transformer. What's a transformer? Yeah, they are more than meets the eye. Okay, it is not this one. Okay, right? But rather these things. Okay. And pun intended, they have, well, this isn't a pun. This is just a literal statement. They have transformed your lives. Without these devices, you could not get electrical power to your house. Well, efficiently. We'll put it that way. Okay. What does a transformer do? It trades. It trades voltage for current and vice versa. Why do we need trade voltage for current? I'll explain that in a little bit. Let's talk about what's inside these little black boxes that we plug our phones into, or if you've seen them on the power poles in your neighborhood. Not all neighborhoods have power poles here in Fresno, I've noticed. Some of them have underground power lines. Uh, and so what you're looking for is like a, a, like a, like a green box <laughs> somewhere in the neighborhood, okay? because the transformer is inside there. But um, they're usually like these canister type things. They can blow up uh, quite uh, spectacularly um, because of the reason you're about to see. But, but this is what, so this isn't actually how you make one. This is more of like a simplified diagram of what's going on inside of a transformer. A transformer consists of an iron core, a rod or piece of metal, Sometimes a circular piece of metal uh, in a loop. But anyway, that iron core has two different coils wrapped around it. A primary coil and a secondary coil. What we're playing with here is the number of turns. You send an input into the coil. And we want this current going into the primary to be oscillating alternating current because what we want to do is we want to change the flux through those coils. By sending the current one direction, we create a magnetic field pointed along the rod. And then if we flip the current, it flips the direction of the magnetic field in the rod. And then back and forth and back and forth, we're constantly flipping. In the United States, the rate of this flip is 60 hertz. 60 hertz from beginning to end. In the uh, European Union, it's 50 hertz. There's a little bit of a disagreement as to what's better, what's worse, but they're, they're pretty close to each other, right? So uh, enough to throw off <laughs> electronic devices if you're not careful, but in terms of safety, they're about the same. So 60 times a second, the magnetic field will go one way and then return back to the other way. 
So basically, because it flips twice in a, in a cycle, 120 times a second we're getting a change in magnetic flux in this iron rod. To which is attached a secondary coil that's going to some load somewhere. They're using a light bulb in this example. And so what can you tell me about the flux through the secondary compared to the primary? They're wrapped around the same center piece of iron. What has to be true? They're changing not only at the same rate, but the flux is exactly the same. And so if we go to Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, uh, I'll do it on, yeah, I'll do it on this drawing, why not? Okay, we have an EMF in the primary, okay? It's gonna be equal to the number of turns in the primary. I'm gonna drop the minus sign for Lenz's law because we're not really worried about clockwise and counterclockwise here. And then we have a change in magnetic flux in time. And we've got the same thing going on over here in the secondary. Number of turns in the secondary, change in magnetic flux in time. Both of these can be solved for this change in magnetic flux. And I just taught you that the thing that is the same in the primary and the secondary is this change in magnetic flux. By the way they're made and how they're designed and the physics of what's going on here, those two fluxes, fluxi, fluxes, are the same. So that means I can set these two statements equal to each other, right? In other words, the voltage in the primary divided by the number of turns in the primary is going to be equal to the voltage in the secondary divided by the number of turns in the secondary. If I solve this for the secondary, I get N2 over N1 times the voltage in the primary. So what happens if the secondary has more turns than the primary? What's the, what's the ratio right here going to be? A number bigger or smaller than one? If N2 is bigger than N1. It's gonna be bigger, right? So this is called a step up transformer. A step up transformer takes the input EMF, the input voltage, and makes it go higher, steps it up. That means your secondary has more turns in it than the primary. What if we flip it? What if our secondary has fewer turns in it? So that N2 is smaller than N1. Then this number is smaller than one, which means our voltage is going to step down. So the term step up and step down refer to what the voltage is doing. Okay. Because Power and energy must be conserved. The power in the primary and the power in the secondary have to be the same. We can't, it's the same amount of time and it's the same amount of energy. Can't make or destroy energy in this setup ever. Um, we know that the current in the primary and the voltage in the primary has to be equal to the current in the secondary times the voltage in the secondary. Here I'm using V instead of E. EMF, voltage, same thing for you guys. What that tells me right there is that if the voltage in the secondary goes up, in order to maintain that equal sign, the current has to go down. So the current is doing the opposite of what the voltage is doing. So in a step up transformer, what happens to the current? It goes down, okay? What we're doing is we're trading voltage for current, essentially. So we can get really high voltages if, the, if we can get the current to be low in the transformer. And we do that by changing the number of turns. But, Mr. Bailo, why, why would we do that? Okay, so we'll get to the why here in a second. Notice, what do you need in order for this to work? You need alternating current. Because if this is DC, Direct current, meaning the current goes in and just goes one direction. Well, you'll get a short, a short change in flux, 
But after that, the flux isn't changing it. Like when you turn it on, the flux will change. And so there'll be a flash of light. But after that, the flux won't change anymore and you will get nothing. Transformers do not operate on DC power, direct current power, only alternating current power. So let me show you how to do a calculation with one of these, okay? They're pretty straightforward calculations if you can wrap your head around step up, step down, and what's going on, okay? And then let me tell you why <laughs> it's important. Okay, this input voltage and current, those are the primary, what goes into the transformer. So my, my primary voltage is 120 volts. My primary current is five amps, okay? Number of turns in my primary is 800, and number of turns in my secondary is 200. Is this a step up or step down transformer? This is step down, right? My number of turns is decreased. So we already know what's supposed to happen. What should happen to the voltage? It should get lower, step down. And what should happen to the current? goes up. All right. So how are we going to get there? Well, we have a statement that says if I if I know the, you can use E or V, it doesn't matter. If I know the voltage in my primary, number of turns in my primary, I know the voltage in my secondary, number of turns in my secondary. What is the output voltage and current? That's secondary, the thing that comes out. So V2, N2 over N1, V1. So that's 200 over 800 times 120 volts. Uh, 200, that's one fourth, isn't it? And one fourth of 120 is 30. Is that right? 30 volts. Secondary voltage of 30 volts. Okay. Well, if the um, if it stepped down four times, what's going to happen to the current? It's going to step up four times, isn't it? So four times uh, five amps is going to be twenty amps. Is the math hard here? No. Okay. Making sure that you have the concept and right, okay, for step up and step down, um, is, is fairly essential, right? Being able to work your way through transformer problem. Okay, Mr. Baylor, but why am I calculating these things in the first place? What I have here is a lot of magnets. I've got several horseshoe magnets, okay, um, all right here, okay, there's three of them to provide a nice strong magnetic field between their poles where, and it's very difficult to see, but there is a coil of wire down inside of here, a, a solenoid, okay. That solenoid is attached to a crank. So as I turn this crank, the solenoid in here spins around, and it's spinning around in the uh, sorry, it's spinning around in the presence of a magnetic field. So as I turn this coil of wire, the flux in that coil changes. Here I'm I'm changing the angle, the orientation of the coil in the presence of a steady state magnetic field. This is a light bulb, a special kind of light bulb, so that you can see what's going on here. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate, I'm going to turn this coil in the magnetic field. So in other words, I'm going to change the flux through the coil. What's the coil going to do? It's going to resist that change and generate a coil, uh, current and voltage of its own. And if uh, I get the right current and voltage, I should be able to see it light up. Okay? Let's spin it faster, it gets brighter. If I spin it slowly, it gets dimmer, and if you're here towards the front, can you describe what's happening if I turn it slow? It's flickering, isn't it? Okay. Well, in truth, all light bulbs flicker. 
well, incandescent ones, not the new LED ones. Okay, they're doing quantum mechanics, so cats are being uh, both alive and dead at the same time. And that's for an incandescent bulb, though. Okay, the flicker is 120 times per second. Can your eyeball see that? No. Okay, that's why a light bulb, an incandescent light bulb, looks like it's on steadily. It's not. It's flickering back and forth. Actually, there is an LED flicker. Um, you may have encountered it on like certain slow mo videos on like YouTube and stuff, and you can overcome that flicker by being clever. But um, what did I just do here? By rotating this handle, what happened? I generated electricity, didn't I? Now we're back to generators. Okay, and what kind of current naturally came out of that generator? Alternating or direct? It was alternating, it was flickering, okay? Back and forth. All of our generators in the United States turn with a 60 times per second rotation frequency. So, if you can turn a coil, in a magnetic field, you can cause an electrical output. But because that coil is rotating, Lenz's law says that we're going to have half of the rotation being current one direction, where the flux is increasing and it's fighting, and then the other way is going to be decreasing, and so it's going to say, wait, 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 I want to keep that, and it's going to flip its direction, and the direction of this voltage and current in this coil are going to oscillate naturally in time, and instead of attaching, say, human beings to turning the thing around, maybe we throw hamsters in a wheel and get the hamsters to turn the wheel, or steam? Steam is just a lot of hamsters, right? If we can boil water and we can direct that steam onto some turbine blades and those turbine blades begin to turn, we can take the output of that turbine and connect it to a coil of wire in the presence of a magnetic field. And what have I just described? A power plant. What's a power plant? It's a very big coffee maker. Because what do most power plants do? Boil water. So coal-fired power plant, which thankfully are on the decline in the United States very rapidly, by the way. I think it was last year that coal and natural gas were like even, and now coal is lower than natural gas in terms of electrical, which is very good. Coal, very, very bad, very dirty, causes all kinds of air pollution, that kind of stuff. But coal, natural gas, and oil, basically every <laughs> bad form of energy, right, the, the, the ones that are uh, causing uh, carbon dioxide to increase in our atmosphere, are doing one thing, and that is boiling water. You take that fuel, you burn it, you boil water, you send that boiling water into a turbine, that turbine turns a coil in the presence of a very large magnet, which generates around 10 to 12,000 volts coming out of the generator. But now you have the problem of getting that electrical power and energy to the consumers, right? And so you have to transmit it, usually over long distances. So to transmit at 12,000 volts, is uh, very inefficient. I did some calculations here, okay? Um, the, if, you, if you've ever been out like to 99, uh, 99 that way, uh, and uh, even further like to the five, you've seen the big power, the electrical power lines, okay? Those lines uh, were 500,000 volt lines. They were updating them to megawatt lines the last time I checked a few years ago, okay? So a million volts, okay? 
of electrical voltage on those lines. Super high voltage, and those go up and down the state of California for transmitting power very long distances. You do not want 500,000 volts coming into your house. Because if you did, there's really nothing you could do with it. Because at 500,000 volts, the current in that line is very, very small. Because of that, Ohm's law, and because of the power law. Energy is energy. You can't make it, you can't destroy it. If a power plant produces a megawatt of electrical power, then a megawatt gets delivered to the city. Matter of fact, power plants change their output depending on demand, live, in real time. If a city is not demanding that much power, the power plant has to reduce the amount of that. If the city is ramping up its power, then the power plant has to ramp up its power. This equation right here, the power equation, if we substitute in for V, Ohm's law, gives you one of the equations I gave you before when it comes to power, current, and resistance. This is often called the power lost equation. Because if you have resistance anywhere in your wire, the amount of power that gets used up converting that electrical energy into heat, remember resistance causes the heating of a wire, goes as the square of the current. So if you don't want to lose electrical power, what do you want your current to be? As big or as small as possible? Very small. You want your resistance, of course, to be zero, but that's not possible, okay? Remember, resistance goes as length as well as cross-section length, which is why the wires are really big, but they're also really, really long because you've got to go from northern to southern California, right? Okay, so hundreds of miles long. Your resistance is more or less fixed. But current, you have control over. And why do you have control over the current if you're PG&E or SoCal Edison? Because you have a transformer. You can transform or trade voltage for current. Ramp the voltage up as high as you can. That makes the current be really, really small. On a, on a 230 kilovolt line at 10 cents per kilowatt hour, so let's say electrical energy costs 10 cents per kilowatt hour, okay? Over a one kilometer section, one kilometer length, 10 cents per kilowatt hour, 230,000 volts, $36 per day of electrical energy is lost to heat. Doesn't cost $36 per se, but $36 of what you could give to a consumer goes into heating up the wire in the atmosphere. On a 22 kilovolt line, so stepping down the voltage, upping the current, over that same one kilometer at 10 cents per kilowatt hour, it's almost $4,100 per day. most efficient way to transmit electricity is to transmit it at high voltage. Which is why it comes out of the power plant, gets stepped up, and now we're at megavolt, okay? And then it comes to the city and gets stepped down into a substation. These are the things that look like a, uh, alien landing facilities here in Fresno. They usually have a lot of wires and big boxes in them, and then there's a, a chain link fence around it, and it says high voltage, don't go in here. That sign is real. Okay, it is high voltage in there. You don't want to be inside. Okay, but that's where they take the 500,000 volts, bring it down to 20,000 volts, that then goes into a neighborhood where it gets stepped down in the neighborhood to 240, and 240 is what comes to your house. They split the 240 volt line, uh, 240 volts for your dryer, but then everything else, 120 volts, uh, and you get you can get 100, 200 amp circuits at your house. Depending on what you mean. Most, most houses are a 100 amp circuit. But it's the transformer that allows this power distribution to happen. Direct current can do it, but it can't step up or down, which is its problem. That's the end of chapter 22.
Chapter 23 is going to happen in one day, this Thursday, because we're cutting section portions of it out, but also because we're going to cheat really hard on chapter 23. You'll see why when we get there. Have a great rest of the day.